morning and welcome to the Tuesday, March 21st, 2023 Tingsboro School Committee meeting. Please be reminded that these meetings are audio and video recorded. My name is Becky Stanton and I call this meeting to order. We'll start with introductions with Nate. Hi, Nate Marino, student representative. Jeff Bowe. Dustin Puma. Good evening, Mike Woodlock, assistant superintendent. Hi, Mike Swanigan, superintendent. Anthony Tenerall. Ryan McMahon. Danielle Lathanis. Rob Mullen. Good evening, Joe Messina, school business administrator. And this evening, we also have the Finance Committee with us. Good evening, Ron Schneider. Ed Smith. Welcome. Please rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll seek a motion to approve the minutes <laughs> from the Budget Subcommittee meeting on January 31st, 2023, the February 7th, 2023 School Committee meeting minutes, and the February 7th, 2023 Executive Session minutes. Uh, executive Session meeting minutes not to be released at this time. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain? Opposed? That carries. Uh, citizen time? Seeing none, I will seek a motion to take Items 8B and 8C out of order. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? That carries. Um, 8B. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to just to provide the committee with an update, um, pleased to say, and I can go to the next slide. Appreciate it. Pleased to say that the uh, capital improvement project that we've been working uh, in collaboration with Valley Collaborative over the past several years uh, is finally complete. Uh, HVAC system, new windows, new playground, all new uh, paint and, and uh, certainly additional uh, renovations put into that facility by Valley Collaborative. Um, the spreadsheet is on the next slide, but I think these pictures tell a, a better story. Uh, that's, that was a building that, that we've had a lease, a long-term lease with them beginning back in 2016. Uh, we uh, renegotiated the lease probably two years ago. We signed it last January. Uh, to have them put in more funding to actually complete the window project there. So that is a viable building uh, that, that's widely in our community. Uh, I think the three important things about that are we were able to work in collaboration with Valley Collaborative to invest $2.7 million into that school at no cost to the taxpayer. I think the second thing that's important is we have a viable tenant in that school that will continue to make enhancements and improvements not coming out of their lease money. They're doing it anyways on their own because they appreciate the facility. Additionally, it provides an opportunity for Tingsboro students who require that programming to be at a school in their own community, which obviously reduces our costs in terms of transportation because kids are on vans for a much shorter distance. And I think the final point that I want to nail home with the community is as a result of this lease agreement, which runs through 2033, $150,000 of that lease over the next 10 years, or $1.5 million, will be used to offset any borrowing done for the Tingsboro Middle School. As you recall, last year, uh, the town manager and the board of selectmen came up with a, a spending plan on how they're going to finance it for the next 10 years. $150,000 of that per year, or $1.5 million, was coming from uh, this Valley lease. So the project is complete. The school looks great. Valley finished painting the outside trim as well. Uh, they've updated the playground. Um, they just do a great job and are a great partner to have in our community. So I'm happy to say that it took us a while to get here, um, but we're here, and it's fruitful for both the community and for the students at Valley. So I just want to provide that quick synopsis. Mike, if you just go to the next slide. Uh, Mr. Messina, that's the spending breakdown uh, to date, so $2.64 million. So if the committee has any questions about that, you've seen the lease. We've had these discussions all along. I just wanted to finally say that we're putting the cherry on top and it's over. That's great. I'm happy to see that school is, it, it's like a new school. Thank it you is. It's got good bones, so we appreciate that. Any further discussion? Questions for Dr. Blanagan? No? All right, we can move on to 8C. Great. So our initial budget presentation, uh, we've tried for the past month to get before you and have this meeting. Uh, however, uh, Mother Nature did not cooperate. Um, so, so much like we've done in the past, the budget development process 
um, is, a, is a, an ongoing fluid process that begins in December. We work with the administrative teams and we identify needs in the district. We look at our programming. And I think one of the things that we say each and every year, it's important not to just pick up what we have and put it down the following year. We really need to look at our students, look at our population, look at our needs. And that is driven by our strategy for district improvement. We know what our goals are. We know what we hope to accomplish for, for our, our community as a public education system. And we need to make sure that we can develop a budget that supports that. Um, that being said, uh, we have been working with the town manager, Mr. Messina, and I have had several meetings with uh, Matt Hansen, the town manager, uh, to talk about where we are at the budget. We've had several check-ins. Um, and I would say that this year has been, has been certainly more difficult than, than any I can recall. Um, as a superintendent. This was, this was the most difficult budget process we've had, given the fact that uh, we're seeing significant increase in, in, uh, in percentages and, and uh, costs across the board. Um, as the committee will recall, we talked about OSD. That's another highlight that we'll touch on a slide here in a little bit. Uh, Operational Service Division, which is a branch of the uh, Executive Office, Administration of Finance, and that 14%. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And just the overall increase in needs of students. Um, you know, the demographics in our schools are changing, um, and we've had conversations ongoing about this throughout the year. Um, but the number of services, tuitions, and transportation um, have really gone up. And, and for those who don't know at home, um, you know, this budget that you're going to see tonight, this initial budget presentation, this represents anyone in Tingsboro age two years and nine months through age 22 who requires specialized services. This isn't about Tingsboro Elementary, Tingsboro, Tingsboro High. This goes beyond that. Any child in this district who's aged two years and nine months through age 22 that requires specialized services is built into this budget because we're obligated per Mass General Law to educate those childs and provide those services. So as we think about this budget, and I know that Mr. Messina is going to hammer this home, there are literally thousands of moving parts. These kids, our staff, their needs, changes every day. This budget is developed as of here and now, today, March 21st, I believe. Um, it's going to change. It, it's going to evolve. It needs to be somewhat fluid. We don't know who's going to move in the district, district this summer. We don't know who's going to move out of this district this summer. We don't know what staff are going to leave uh, in June or what staff we're going to have to hire in June. Uh, this budget is for here and now, and there needs to be some fluidity in it because of the changing demographics and the thousands of moving parts. So that's the overall synopsis. As we think about the cost of education, we'll go to the next slide, please. Mr. Messina is going to touch on a couple important factors, foundation budget as well as Chapter 70. So I'll turn to Mr. Messina at this time. Thank you, Dr. Flanagan. So uh, we're going to talk a lot tonight about what we see in increases as we develop the budget. And uh, this slide just shows the foundation budget for Tingsboro that's set by the state, as well as the required district contribution, what Tingsboro is expected to put towards education. And then uh, the difference is the uh, Chapter 70 aid that comes from the state for education for Tingsboro. You can see uh, year over year that the percent change is growing. The foundation budget grows by over 5%. The required district contribution grows by over 3%. But what the state is giving us is less than 1% and an increase in aid. So even though they tell us that our foundation budget will increase and the required net school spending will increase, they don't match up with the aid that they provide to us. So we'll go to the next slide. So we talk about the, uh, the cost. We talked a little bit about uh, Operational Service Division, OSD. Essentially, what happened was a unilateral decision was made in September, October by the uh, Executive Office of Administration and Finance that private residential programs should increase their tuitions by 14%. As you look on here, from FY11 to FY23, the average growth was 2.7%. In one year, it's jumping by 14%. So that alone is a $137,000 increase to our budget. There have been 
we've we've advocated. Um, I, I, I made the town manager aware of this on November 2nd in an email. I reached out to uh, Senator Kennedy, Representative Gary, myself, as well as superintendents throughout the state to say a 14% jump in one year is unheard of and is, is crippling to a lot of districts. Um, you know, you see $137,000 uh, increase right there. Our growth is about 600000 as a district. Uh, that's at 2.7%. So, so that 137 certainly uh, is impactful to our budget this year. So we've had conversations about this. We've seen this coming, uh, but it's certainly something we have to, to deal with. Next slide. The other thing is I talked a little bit about the changing demographics of our community. You know, though our district enrollment has decreased by 5.27% in one year, our special education services increased by 5.76%. So as a district, we're at 21.7% of students who required individualized specialized services. With that comes costs. With that comes support services um, and related service providers and substantially separate programming. So there is a cost that comes with that. In addition to that, we talk about the demographics changing in the community. In just 2019, we had 54 students who were identified as English learners. We now have 120 students. Again, with that comes an additional level of support and staffing to support those kids and make sure that they're successful in the classroom. We talk about out-of-district tuition costs going up by 4 to 5% across the board. That's an increase of $689,000 to the district. With out-of-district tuitions comes transportation. That cost is increased by $114,000. All of that being said, and I like to say this every year, these are our kids. And we're going to do everything we can to provide them all the all services and education they need. The fact of the matter is there's a cost that goes with it. So as we try to live with the 2.7%, it becomes very difficult. As you recall, a few months ago, we were back here and we presented our preliminary budget, not the initial budget, the budget, the preliminary budget. And at that point, when we took in the factors of what the administration was requesting, what we thought we needed for need, student needs, what we thought we needed for support services, we were at about a 6.6% .6 increase. So we went back to our administrative team and we said we need to tighten the belt, we need to look at every possible solution. And as I said at the beginning, the onset, we don't just pick it up and put it down next year. We look at what our kids need. As you recall, last year, at this time last year, this committee made a decision that we're gonna prioritize social emotional learning. Well, because those are the last positions in doesn't mean those are the first ones up. That need hasn't changed, so we're not going to do that. We're going to have to think differently about the rest of our programming to see how we get from 6.6% down to 2.7%. All of that being said, that's the high-level version of where we are. Now I get to turn it to Mr. Messina, and we get to get into spreadsheets. So we'll be happy to – we're going to go through it and we'll answer any questions you have, uh, and we'll kind of play off each other here. So, Mr. Messina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Flanagan. And, uh, to uh, sort of save Dr. Uh, Mr. Woodlock from bouncing between pages and everybody trying to see the pages, I, I, did, leave a, I did leave a packet for everybody. Uh, so this packet is basically what, what Mike is going to work on the screen. But uh, the top page is where we left the budget on February 7th. Um, for the members of the Finance Committee, this is basically our budget condensed to focus on what I what I'd like to call our three big rocks: staffing, um, out of district tuitions, transportation, and then as a smaller rock, utilities. And as you can see, that's pretty much um, the largest amount of the school committee budget, right right in those four areas. So on February seventh, what we're looking for for preliminary budget in terms of what we current currently had for staff, along with a few asks of the administrative team down below was a 23.7 million dollar budget or a 6.6 percent increase mm -hmm. and i think at that time i think the school committee the superintendent and myself all realized that we were not going to come to the town and ask for a 6.6 percent increase you know we're as the superintendent said we're going to work with the administrative team look at what our needs are look to see where we can make some adjustments and go from there. And one thing we, the school committee didn't see back on February 7th was where the current staffing in is. And the second page is just basically the February 7th budget looking at not just 
the FY23 budget and the FY24 budget, but the middle column as to where our current headcount is. So we're currently at slightly over 255 staff, and with a slight increase in the part-timer, that's where that top number started at 255.3 for staff, with the one additional ELL teacher added um, at the bottom, brought us to the preliminary budget of 256.3 for staff. So if you look at the third page, this is basically how do we get from the February 7th budget to where we are tonight. So realizing we, we had about a $1.4 million growth and six additional staff people from last year's budget, we took a look at some of the areas where we could make some changes. So the first change is uh, part of our revenue offsets is a credit that Valley Collaborative issues um, if they have more tuitions uh, collected than planned. They do have an agreement in place with the state to give the money back to the member districts. What we historically have done is used a portion of that to offset our budget and any additional monies from Valley for um, tuitions goes into the SPED stabilization account at the town level. Mm -hmm. So we initially had a $25,000 number in that Valley credit um, compared to $50,000 last year. With the superintendent meeting with Valley Collaborative, it looked like they could probably be able to staff to a level of where they would continue to have a growth in their tuitions and have money that they would be able to give back to the member districts. So even though we didn't get a credit from them this year, we feel comfortable going back to the original amount of that credit in, um, similar to last year's budget. The next line represents, we have uh, two identified retirees, um, longstanding teachers, that if we replace them with a step one new hire, that will save us about $56,000 in the budget. We have one out of district student that we identified, um, again, as the superintendent mentioned, um, we are res fiscally responsible for students up to age 22. At this point, we have an indication that they are actually going to take their diploma early and will not be staying um, in the collaborative, so we are going to remove that tuition from the budget. And that's a risk. Uh, that student may make a, a decision at some point. That student is not 22 yet and is eligible for another year of service, but if they choose not to take their diploma, We'll have to absorb that cost. But there's a level of risk with that. You're just trying to get me. You're just trying to get me. That's it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, at the bottom of the first page, you saw about $11,000 that the, admin, the uh, administrators asked in terms of new supplies, new training, um, some physical plant changes. Uh, we basically looked at those and removed some and others we would absorb into your regular budget, so we took that $11,000 um, out of the budget request. We asked all the uh, budget centers, the schools, and all the support departments to look at their supply materials and reduce wherever possible. Um, that totaled about $61,000 in reduced supplies. The next three all sort of come together as um, a summer learning program, as uh, the school committee knows and for the finance committee, um, we've run a fairly robust uh, summer learning program uh, as a result of COVID and, and some of the gaps in learning. And that was costing about $90,000 uh, to the district. So on the first pass of this, we removed the $90,000 from the budget. But then in conversations with the town manager, um, he thought that um, some of the ARPA funding remaining, I know it's a small amount, but some of the town APA funding, uh, 40,000 of it, might go towards an enhanced ESY program, which will look slightly different than the last two years of summer programming, but slightly larger for extended school year than we were running previously. And just out of caveat to that, ESY is a mandated program uh, for students who are on IEP, so we are obligated to run that program. What we've done in the past is partnered that with what we call the Jumpstart program to do those, uh, fill some of those gaps, hopefully, from the past COVID years. What we're looking to do is uh, keep ESY intact. Obviously, we're mandated to do that, and we will. 
um, but we're really going to modify what Jumpstart looks like. Um, we, we did some research um, and pulled some data from all the schools, and we're not really – I think the data is inconclusive as to how successful it was filling some of those gaps. So uh, at this point, you know, it, it, it's a cost, and it's certainly – you know, that additional $50,000, that's a teacher in the classroom for the school year. So uh, we're, we're comfortable or we're, we, we prefer to pull off of that uh, and, and not offer that programming. So that's, that's the plan going forward. Thank you. Um, also, in meeting with the town manager, as we discussed the um, operational services division, 14% increase in tuitions, um, the town manager thought that Transferring $100,000 for free <coughs> cash into the SPED stabilization would uh, be able to um, supplement the school committee budget uh, should the out-of-district tuitions um, reach the level that we think they're going to reach. And again, that would be an item that we would try to keep that um, as untouched as possible as the school year goes through. Uh, we are utilizing all of the SPED stabilization money in this budget reconciliation. And it certainly would be our goal to protect as much of that stabilization going forward um, into next year. After all that look through, um, what it comes down to when we were looking at the additional uh, reductions is staffing. And looking at the non-instructional support staff, uh, just giving a hard look at uh, those departments, we're recommending a three and a half staff cut in those departments, which will save the district approximately $142,000. Um, the next two, uh, Dr. Flanagan, if sure, you want to we, take um, the next two. Historically, uh, we've tried to empower teachers and provide leadership opportunities. Currently, we have 20 leadership opportunities for teachers in the district. By reducing that from 20 to 14, um, we'll be able to save $26,000. And the position that we would target there would be district-wide and non-core subject uh, leadership positions. Um, and then the final one is uh, it's, it comes down to reduction in staffing. So as we look at reducing five positions across the district, I think one of the things that we talked about was taking the two retirees and absorbing those positions. So as we think about different grade levels, and I prefer not to get into specific grade levels right now, uh, we don't have the benefit of having multiple elementary schools or middle schools. So if we say grade three, there's only five of them having lunch tomorrow together. So uh, it's not grade three, but if we talk about that. So basically, if we reduce those two retiree positions and absorb those, um, class size would go from 17 and 18 in some of our grades to 21, 22 some of our grades. Still manageable, still within the contractual language. The other thing we talked about was looking at our special education delivery pattern. If we were to reduce two special education positions in the district, we could deliver um, special education in a different manner um, at the middle school. Um, so it would be, you know, 77 students by between five teachers, which is a case of about 16 students per teacher, which is appropriate and which jives with what we do at the elementary and the high school. Um, it would just break up that potential teaming model of that. Now, that doesn't mean they're all going to have 16 students that we would assign based on need and caseload, but um, that's about the average, which is appropriate for the district. Uh, not best practice, certainly not best practice for teaming, but it, it would be um, something that we could do. And the other thing was we have currently six substantially separate programs at TES. We could potentially, uh, because of students matriculating to the middle school and uh, looking at student needs, we could potentially go down to five substantially separate programs at uh, TES. So that would be uh, another position there. And the final position, the fifth position that we talk about, um, we prioritize as a, a, a district EL on the budget. We would look at reassigning a teacher in the district from a different discipline, a non-core elective discipline, to potentially move into that role and provide EL support. Um, so those would be the five potential cuts that we're talking about um, to, to staffing uh, and teachers. As we think about this, it's important for me to say, you know, we strive to present as comprehensive a program as possible. Um, and we're mindful of if we cut, let's take middle school art teacher, then we have no middle school art for all our kids because we have a singleton teacher. So we're trying to protect the integrity and, and the breadth of the programming for our students because every kid is going to find their niche somewhere. So we want it to be as broad and comprehensive as possible. So it really came down to class size discussions K to 12. So those would be the um, five potential recommended cuts 
uh, to instructional positions, which would bring us an additional 311,000. Thank you. Um, so that basically is a summary of $863,000 in reductions. Um, it's eight and a half staff people. So that gets your budget at this moment down to uh, 247.8 for staff and a $22.8 million budget, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is a 2.71 growth over this year's budget. So just what that looks like in terms of our budget sheets. Um, the next page is basically the staffing, again, where we were last year for the budget, where we are currently for staffing, and then the new 247.8 staff people for a salary number of a little over $19.4 million. And if you flip to the next page, here is tonight's current budget overview sheet. And this, again, shows you the staffing, uh, the first large cost for your district. Um, out of district tuitions with that slight change, still is a 34% uh, growth. Um, and that, that's based upon, um, for the Finance Committee, that's based upon the roster, way, the way we see develop, it developing on July 1 at this moment in time. Um, so it takes not just students that are currently placed out, but maybe some potential students that we've identified that have moved in since the last budget prep, um, or maybe struggling in, in district. And we, we know that at some point, you know, probably before July 1, there'll have to be a move out of district. So that's, that's the, current, the current roster with that increase. Again, as the super, as superintendent mentioned, uh, for transportation, uh, the regular ed, we actually reduced a bus this year. So even though the cost per bus per day is increasing, um, our overall cost for regular ed transportation is going down $31,000 next year. And specialized transportation, which is the vans, both for out of district and uh, for in district for our uh, students, um, is increasing by $114,000. Utilities, that's a, a small increase of 8%, and that's primarily due to when we, when we prepare the budget for utilities, we're always looking at our last actual full year of utilities. And when we developed last year's budget, that last full year was the COVID year. And we really, you know, didn't take into account the fact that our usage dropped dramatically due to the shutdown of the buildings. So we were, we were slightly under budget this year. Fortunately, we're getting some better rates for natural gas, and we have a very good rate for electricity that we're locked into for next year. So the increase um, is only, only going up by $30, $38,000 there. Um, the next set of numbers are all of the various budget centers, the schools and the support departments and what their expenses uh, look like compared to um, last year. <coughs> Excuse me. And you'll see um, a, lot of, a lot of that is the reduction in supply of materials at the budget centers, but um, also takes into account those Merrimack Fellows that we do not have in this year's budget that we had in last year's budget um, that basically translated to where we are with the increase in staff this year. Um, for cover page expenses, I actually broke this out going forward on the budget overview page, just so you can see what some of those um, cover page expenses are. These are expenses don't, that don't fit into any of the budget centers. Um, again, you can see the summer learning, the, the reduction we spoke about. Um, the grant funding, um, that's, that's primarily a line that when we have grants that we receive that aren't targeted to any particular budget line. In order to balance the budget when we look at revenues, we have to come up with the targeted areas that aren't in our budget that those grants are gonna be spent on. Um, the rest are all um, even. Pensions go up on this, on this sheet due to the fact that when we talk about revenue on the next page, we're using the last of our COVID ESSR grant funding um, the last $300,000 that we've reserved for next year's budget. And when we pay a salary out of a grant, it's mandated that we pay 9% to uh, the retirement board 
for any federal salaries uh, that are paid out of those grants. So that's why you see that number increasing. And um, the, other, the other revenue number in blue, um, if you can just flip to the next page, this is basically um, all of the revenues outside of the school committee budget that supplement the school committee budget in, in running the system. Um, you see grant revenues are up by 13%, and again, primarily because that ESSER grant will be used um, to zero it out. Uh, tuitions are down primarily because the exchange program is not as robust as we had hoped it to be. So we always use the previous year's exchange tuition revenue mm -hmm. for the next year's budget. So this is based upon what we have for students this year to use the revenue for next year. And then any revenue we, go, we get next year will go towards FY25. Um, athletic, athletic revenues are pretty much static. And the rest of the other source revenues, um, Medicaid, school choice, uh, student parking, um, lease money, circuit breaker, sped stabilization, as well as the town APA. Um, the highlight I want to give you there, as I mentioned before, uh, this budget is balanced based upon full use of our stabilization account for special education. So that's 234000 Again, it would be our hope to hold that as harmless as possible as we go through next year's spending. Um, certainly hope not to drain it down to zero. So that $3.2 million in revenue, you can actually see at the bottom of the previous page. And with the Valley Collaborative credit being the same as last year, we come down to that same $22.8 million that you saw on the previous slide. And finally, the last two pages of the packet is just basically your two-page budget as we normally present it without taking it in the overview form and, and putting it back out to the um, each budget center uh, by salaries and by expenses. Unfortunately, all three of those tie out to the same number, which certainly wanted to make sure that was going to happen. Yeah. Madam Chair, if I could just make one final comment. I think, I think we, um, as a community, benefit in so many ways from having somebody who's done this job for 22 years and knows every line in this bottom budget, knows every dollar in this budget, and does a phenomenal job with understanding it presenting it, explaining it to the superintendent multiple times, telling me, no, we can't do that. Yes, we can do this. Um, so we're, we're so fortunate to have Mr. Messina here. Um, and I would encourage anyone at home who's, who's looking, this, this material is all available online. If you have any questions about it, please reach out to Mr. Messina directly. Um, it, 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 it's, it was difficult to get here. Um, but, you know, with Mr. Messina's direction and advice we, uh, and counsel, we got there. So that's where we are. And we're happy to answer any questions about it. Joe's happy to answer any questions about it. <laughs> I have um, more of an, an observation. Um, these are a lot of cuts. We haven't seen cuts like this in our budget in mm -hmm. my, my tenure on the committee. Um, th this feels like a lot of cuts, mm -hmm. and you know what the school needs. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't seem sustainable. So when we're, I, I know we need to deal with the year ahead of us, but when we're here the next year, Mm -hmm. We can't do this again, can we? I hope not. Okay. I mean, no. I mean, it, it, no. We can't cut eight and a half positions every year. Yeah. Um, you know, right now we're getting class sizes up to 22 to 24. Um, you know, the next thing is 28 to 30, and that's a contractual issue. We can't have 30 kids in a classroom. That's not best practice. That's not even appropriate. Um, you know, and this budget right here reflects the wants and, and, and desires of the district from. December, and even in December when we went with the administrative team, it was, listen, this is going to be a rough budget year, so we need bare bones requests. Um, this doesn't talk about the additional social emotional needs we have. This doesn't talk about a literacy coach in the elementary school. This doesn't talk about bringing a math coach or literacy coach up to the middle school. All things that we've had conversations about in the past, um, we came with very limited requests um, in, in December and, and kind of worked off of that. Um, so, no, you know, and, I, and we've had this we had this conversation with the, with the town manager. The two point seven, I understand that it's it's nice, but when we have thousands of moving parts and kids that could potentially walk into the district, you know, I, for those at home who don't know, 
uh, a residential program could be upwards of $350,000 for one student. Um, and, and if that student moves into, into this community in, in July, it's our obligation. And this budget's already been approved. And this is what we're living with. So there, there, there are a lot of moving parts, and it's, it's a fluid process. You say it all the time. You didn't say it tonight, but the budget is a living, breathing thing. Um, so we can't continue to go eight and a half cuts a year. That being said, circuit breaker potentially could go up next year. Some of our revenues could potentially go up next year because of this extraordinary impact of our district costs this year. Um, so there could be some offset there. Um, you know, I know that on the town side, I mean, we all know that new growth was, was, was down. It wasn't what it was projected to be. So that impacts as well. If there's new growth in the community, that could potentially help it. So um, it's, it's hard. It's virtually impossible to say it's going to be this percentage every year going forward when we don't know what our staffing and our student needs are going to be, and it's going to continue to change. Um, that's, just, that's just the nature of budgeting for us. <clears throat> Stanton? Sure. Yeah. So I, I just I'll, I'll echo what you said. Um, but first, let me just say that knowing all the moving parts here, I, I applaud what, what you've done because I know this is near impossible to, to get right and, and to live within that 2.7 percent. You know what I'm seeing is is that that out of district and the and the transportation is you know 770 thousand dollars increase just there, and and we're really essentially slashing the rest of the budget just to keep funding that. And, and so I guess one of my questions is, do we have a feel, is, is this an aberration? Or, or are we seeing you know, much larger increases in the out of, out of district and in, in, in the transportation budget than the 2.7% we'll, we'll, you know, that we're trying to live within? Is this going to be something that we're going to be facing with? Because I agree with you. I don't think that we can continue to do that because we're cutting teachers just to be able to fund those two, those two line items. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we talk about every year with transportation is, um, and, and don't get me wrong, we love our provider, they do a great job, right. but when we go out to bid, we generally get one bid. And I think that could be echoed in every community in the Commonwealth. Um, so the, the competitive bid process is one of the things that we, we first have to deal with. In terms of an aberration, Joe, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Um, so I guess the the smartest way for me to say that is we don't know right and and we've had some budget subcommittee meetings that we talked about um, the needs of the preschool currently and generally when we start looking at a class from year to year we may identify a particular class that for whatever reason may cost the district a little bit more it's happened in the past and we see this preschool class as one of those classes that is is um, highly in need of services and that's some of what's driving some of the specialized transportation as well but the number of students that we're transporting in district has grown tremendously um, this year so we talk about is this an aberration or is this a trend um, I, th I think the superintendents had some discussion at his level in terms of what the services are for the for the younger grades and is this something that we have to identify is going to happen year over year now. Um, is it a pandemic-related blip right. in the budget? So I don't know. I don't think the superintendent knows whether or not we're hoping it's an aberration and maybe just one of those grades that as everything starts to stabilize, both in the economy and in society as a whole in terms of post-pandemic, maybe some of this will calm down and we won't see these large growth numbers. Um, but I think we've said it at building committee meetings. Very rarely do you see the numbers go all the way down. You know, they'll go down and we'll celebrate the fact that they've gone down, right. but they're still up here compared to where they were in the past. Right. And, and I would just add that you, you may hear conversations over the next couple of weeks about Governor Healy potentially putting more money towards offsetting some of the OSD costs to districts across the board. And we would celebrate that and say, hey, that's great, but I'm sure the town manager is saying it's coming from somewhere. So, you know, it's kind of a, a give and take. So, uh, and I would say, I'd like to say, it, it's, it's been out, outstanding working with uh, Matt Hanson on this process as well. It's been, it's been very smooth the past several years. He does a great job. He understands our needs. He recognizes that this is not a Tingsboro issue. This is a, certainly a Commonwealth issue, if not a national issue. Um, but the conversations I'm having in, in local communities, they're all looking, you know, three and a half, four and a half percent increase just to, to maintain services for next year. So um, we're not alone. Yeah, and I, I my, my, my um, just a comment. 
to the extent that you're seeing some of those transportation costs at the much younger grades, we're going to own those students, right? They're not going to disappear. Yes. So we just have to bear that in mind. If we're seeing an increase now, those as they continue to ripple through all the grades, that's going to be the same thing. Yes. Um, and we did have our special education department come in front of the, the school committee um, a couple of meetings ago, and, and we did talk about that as a committee. Is, is this, you know, is this something that it, it, even this grade, if it's an aberration, this grade will travel from preschool on through to grade 12 and, and most likely to age 22. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> you know, certainly in my office, we're, we're well aware of that going forward. Ed, any comments, questions? Uh, well, I mean, I have, this is my first time basically at one of these meetings going through this whole thing, and I have definitely a lot of questions, but I'm, I'm going to read over, and then I'll ask my questions within the next few days, so, you know what I mean, so I'm not wasting everybody's time. Um, you know, I, I do have a lot. The only thing I actually see here that really aggravated me was the student parking. I remember when it first came, my kids were to school. You know, charging the kids the pocket car. I'm sorry, that's just, it's a little thing, it's just $1,000 item. I know you guys are looking for revenue, but I remember one of my kids went to high school and then we first got the thing. And they pay, what do they charge the pocket car? Is it still $200 a year? It's 180, Joe? It's, it, it's $200 to start the year on a sliding scale down. So it does start at 200 if you're, if you're coming in March or April to buy it. Do you pay for more per, like if you have two kids driving, is it still one fee? If they only bring one car, it's only <laughs> one fee. But if they want to have two cars, I, I mean, I, I understand where you're going, my kids, when they were here. I know. Uh, just, I'm just saying, like I said, I haven't read one of these, but this is my first time actually reading the whole school budget. And I'm just mm -hmm. saying that's one of the things that it's a small item. It's only 20 grand. It just it seems like as, when I was a parent with two kids in the high school mm -hmm. and I got that bill, I'm like, why so, to, why related to fees, the budget subcommittee um, I, is planning to reevaluate all fees after we get through the budget cycle. Right. So we are. There has been discussion of looking at all fees, be it athletic fees, participation fees, and parking fees as well. Right. I remember they had the parking fee. Then it was two fifty per sport, and then if you did two sports, it, it went down. I just thought. I mean, I just I just saw that. I, I haven't had had a kid in the high school. I mean, I have three kids. Well, one. My grandson's in first grade, and I got two going to be born the next three months that are going to be coming through the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know this is, this is a hard budget for you guys, and I mean, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. Like I said, I agree, there's moving parts. You don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's coming into the school this year, who's moving into town, who's moving out of town. Your budget could change by half a million dollars at the blink of an eye without you even knowing it. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you for doing all, all this work. I hope we know it. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I know, but I'm saying it, it's a moving target. It, yes, there's absolutely. No, there's no way to tell what's going to happen during the school year. You could have three people move in, two move out, and you just don't know. I applaud you for the special. I know Tingsbury is one of the best special eds in the, in the area. And I would say, you know, we can, we can talk about cutting fees, but it's like pushing on a balloon, right? If we decrease that, then it's going to have to come from somewhere. If we're going to stay at 2.7, so right, right. it's it's you know it's just pushing and shoving to try to figure out where you're going to make that cut or where you're going to find that revenue from. Um, we would all love not to charge the kids for anything, sure, but that means it's going to come from somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? So, thank you. Thank you. Does the committee have any comments, questions about the budget? I have one question. So, if we're cutting. A positions. Do we have any concerns about? I know we're already struggling when teachers are out covering classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, how does this impact that? Yeah, we're going to be. Yeah, are we concerned about that? Yes, we can't get subs right now as it is. Uh, basically, you know, we have a difficult time covering classes, uh, and our teachers do a great job of supporting each other and covering for each other when they can. But the fact of the matter is, that, you know, at the elementary school, we're pulling paraprofessionals to cover classes. Uh, which means we're not providing services. Um, at the high school, we do the best we can in terms of having teachers cover classes. It's, it, it's a problem. It's a problem. And this won't help us. <laughs> okay, another question on that, on that point. I was, I was going to ask that at a later time. But how do you decide on, like when you said you kid cut eight positions, how does that decision come? Does it go by, you know, what, what needs, what class size is? Yes. 100%. It comes, it, the whole administrative team comes together and we look at what we can do and we think, how can we do things differently? 
uh, to, to provide as comprehensive a program as possible, still supply, providing the kids the support they need. And, you know, if we can, if we can reduce a position because of retirement, we're going to do that. We don't want to put good people out of work. Um, so if we can reassign somebody into a, a new lead position we just created, we're going to do that because we have great teachers in this district. I don't want to lose any of them. But the fact of the matter is our original budget came in at $1.6 million, and, or $1.4 million, excuse me, we have to get it down to 600000 So um, tough decisions were made. But we did that as, an, as a full administrative team. We looked at everything we've done. Um, and, and I mean it when I say we don't just pick it up and put it down. We, we, we look at everything and really refining year over year over year the program we have and how we uh, deliver it to the students of the Tingsboro. Now, this is my first year. Now, what, what has been your average increase over the last five years per year? I know you, you, this year is going to be... 2.5 to 2.8. So between, between 2 and 3% roughly is what you've been averaging every year for an increase. Mm -hmm. This year is an aberration, though. As I said, most communities are going up significantly this year because of the OSD impact as well. So you have district costs um, and, and transportation costs. Joe, it's a fair statement. I don't yes. like throwing numbers on the runner by. No, no, absolutely right. And I think you and I have talked, you know, probably ad nauseum to both of us about this. Um, but it is it is something. And, and in terms of transportation, we're not alone with other districts. I, I'm, I'm a member of a, a group of administrator listserv on emails. And that's the question going out there. How many companies came to your pre-bid conference and how many bids did you get? There is not one single district that's answered, and I think we're up to 25 districts, that didn't say they had one bid. Um, we had one bid uh, two years ago, and DBUS understood that it was a, a large number and came back, and as the lowest bidder, you know, only bidder, they, they, they said, well, maybe we can do a little bit better for you. And, you know, certainly appreciated that DBUS understands the position we're in where they'll say, we're not going to grow it by what we can charge you. We're going to, you know, what we think we can both live with for a number. And, and they've done that many times during the contracts in, in my time here, which I, you know, I think I've always said it to the school committee that, you know, they're very good partners were with us when it comes to that. And certainly when I hear districts saying that they just open bids and they have 14 and 15 percent increases. And a lot of that is bus companies that, the pandemic itself sort of took a chunk out of their business. I mean, we, we shut down operations in March, and we didn't go to school for the rest of the year, and, and we didn't pay the bus company a full amount. We, we negotiated a, a smaller amount just to cover some of their fixed costs. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like many districts, we went hybrid in the fall. And, you know, again, the, the patterns look different than what all of these bus companies in the state were used to dealing with. So a lot of bus companies are coming to their district saying, you know, we need more, we need more, and, and D-Bus didn't do that with us. No, they've been a great partner. Jeff, did you have a question? I, I had a couple. Um, just looking at where we are financially from a national perspective of increasing inflation rates, the banking crisis we're in right now, um, and really kind of facing a recession at the same time. Are we, I think we were seeing that that's very likely that the numbers we're seeing today, we're probably gonna see again next year. Does the 2.7, is that something that, you know, we're trying to stay away from that, the, that six and a half percent mark, but that six and a half in the year after, does that now become eight, nine, ten percent because we're on our heels this year and looking at being even further on our heels in the future? So I guess it's 2.7, just too, too tight. It's tight. It's tight. I mean, we, 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 we pick up a little bit more, right, with the spend stabilization potential safety net. You know, hopefully we're not going there. Uh, we pick up a little bit with the ARPA funding provided that comes through. Uh, and, and Tom Mayer just seems to think that's coming through. So there's a little bit of additional funding on top of the 2.7. So I wouldn't say it's pure 2.7, but, um, it, you know, it, it, it's – I can't answer the question. We don't know. Uh, it's it's going to be tough. Uh, but we, we also don't, we can't project what the revenue is going to be for Circuit Breaker next year. So that will help in some manner. Um, so I'm not trying to dance. I, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. No, I, 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 I yeah. don't think any of us know the right answer to that one. But you know, to sort of piggyback off what the superintendent is saying, you know, with the increased cost in tuitions, 
organically circuit breaker should go up because by law they are supposed to reimburse the school district 75 percent of all of the costs over for a two and a half times foundation but it took them a number of years to fund it to the mandate i think the first year was 50 percent even though the law said you have to fund to 75 percent they gave 50 percent to the t to the cities and towns which I've always recommended to this committee and will always recommend to this committee to use this year's circuit breaker funding in next year's budget because we know what we're getting this year and use next year's funding in the FY25 budget, which organically, if everything is the same, should go up. So that's an increased revenue that, again, will we'll be able to supplement your budget to a certain degree. Medicaid reimbursements have seemed to start to grow uh, the last two years. So if we continue to use a five-year average for Medicaid growth, then that revenue should continue to grow a little bit to help that 2.7 growth number not grow, you know, out to eight and nine percent. And you start at a lower staffing base. If, if, if this is your budget, this budget gets approved, you're starting at 247 staff people at that point. So the growth shouldn't be eight or nine percent because we've, we've reduced by eight and a half. And, and then with the staffing reductions, the potential staffing reductions, you know, we do talk about not leaving students behind, but are we unintentionally not considering the other students that are maybe higher performers that are now not necessarily gonna have the, you know, maybe uh, additional services available to them that is maybe making the classes more challenging for them. So I'll speak to that. In terms of the programming itself, we kept the comprehensive program intact. Essentially, we're, it's, going to go, it's going to be a class size issue this year. Um, you know, we have those two uh, special education things that we're dealing with in terms of how we deliver that programming. But in terms of offering students AP and, and those types of opportunities, those high-end opportunities, those are still going to be intact. We're not going to cut any of those core programs. And we're also going to protect the electives for, for, for those kids who who trend in that bit and succeed in that area. So we're trying to keep it as, as comprehensive as possible. And then one last one, sorry. That's fine. Um, is Wait. there, are there any state or federal grants or funds that we haven't tapped yet that are potentially out Not there? Not a one. <laughs> How to ask it. <laughs> Not a one. It's out there and it's a possibility. We're on it. Thank you. Yeah. My turn? Sure. Okay. So... I noticed the cuts are all directed at teachers and non-instructional support staff, mm -hmm. so eight and a half positions, which means you're talking about class sizes. Mm -hmm. A class size of 10 can feel like 30, and a class size of 25 can feel like 10, depending on the makeup of that class. 100%. With teachers in droves leaving the profession because of significant issues within a classroom by increasing class size in any way shape or form is going to drastically impact many of those teachers everyday existence which is a huge concern okay um, looking at this over what I'm concerned about is that it's always easy to get rid of or to cut non-instructional staff or teachers when the administrative staff came together, did they at any point say, maybe we don't need as many administrators? We did. We had that conversation as well. Because we do have three administrators at an elementary school, mm -hmm. which is significantly more than a lot of districts. Mm -hmm. And granted, we do have a lot of needs there. Sure. And again, is it want versus need? Where if we did lose an administrative position, mm -hmm. which does not have that immediate attention to those 20 kids because kids right now are really struggling. There's significant issues in relation to mental health. Mm -hmm. There's significant issues in different grades that have significantly fallen behind. And that teacher in that room that is able to look at 15 kids instead of 25 kids, those extra 10 kids in that classroom could in some respects not get the services that they need in comparison to maybe not having an administrator. I mean, I'm not trying to target administrators. It's just, it just seems easy 
when, when you're looking at these cuts to not also go for a big ticket paycheck. Mm -hmm. Like, because a big ticket paycheck would be potentially two teacher salaries. And so that would reduce, potentially, I don't know the numbers, I'm not... No, I, I, I understand so the point. I, understand I, I guess, the point, and right. that's my concern, yep. because the reality is it's always easier to go for the teachers, it's always easier to go for the non-instructional support staff. So and I, yet, oh, sorry. there's larger things that can also be, because, I don't know, it just, it just seems like there's a gaping hole in where the cuts are coming. Okay. Okay. I'll respond now. Um, okay. Basically, um, we had those conversations, and we have those conversations every year. And I think in, in October, when we were, came to this committee to talk about adding an administrator at uh, the elementary school, we knew at that point that the budget was going to be difficult. Um, you know, and I, and I look at our administrative structure. Back in 2008, we had five people working in special education. Right now, we have 2.8 people overseeing special education. The needs are going up. The requirements are going up. The paperwork's going up. The legality of it's going up. Um, so we needed that additional position. Um, you know, I go back to 2012 when we restructured the position, eliminated a, a, a dean. Uh, I go back to 2015 when we cut um, an administrator at the elementary school to add a counselor. That counselor's still in place. We're still at three counselors at the elementary school. So in the past, when necessary, we have eliminated administrators if it was appropriate at that time. We had the conversation in the room, um, and it was uncomfortable. Um, but given where we are at this point, and given the, f the fact that this committee supported 7-0 on October 18th to add administrator, I thought it would be not in the best interest of the district to go back, knowing of the requirements, knowing all the paperwork, knowing the expectations, and uh, knowing knowing the needs of our kids. So that was uh, that's our I, recommendation. I think I did express concerns that by adding another administrator, it would cost a teacher, mm -hmm. and now we're costing teachers, mm -hmm. which again the need of students are more teachers to be able to pinpoint their direct needs, not more administrators who are very far removed from the kids who we are serving. And I, I don't disagree with you, but I would also say the operation of a school is incumbent upon the administrator. So effective, appropriate, efficient operation of a school. Probably, but it, I could probably do my job the without the right level of supervision and administration. So I, I, I don't disagree. I, I just think at this point, this is where we are, particularly and in light fine. of the action and we took in October. That's fine. I'm just voicing my concerns that there's a gaping hole in what was cut. I Believe me, I'd rather be at the 1.5 the, the ask. Too. Absolutely. You know, I, I get it. Absolutely. Tough decisions have to be made every year, and I think this is the recommendation that we're bringing forth to the committee. If the committee wants to vote it down, that's entirely the will of the committee. That's fine. I'd just like to say I don't think it's fair to say it was easy to decide to cut teachers. Oh, I don't think, I don't it was think easy, anything but about it's, this. It's just the, Th that's the term you use. It's I just the go to. To be fair to Dr. Flanagan and the staff, I don't think any of this was easy. Oh, I don't think so either, but okay. it's where the cuts always come. It's never an administrator. Well, I well, disagree because the administrators have been cut in the past. Mm -hmm. They haven't been cut in your tenure here, um, they haven't been cut in my tenure here, but we haven't been on the committee that long. They have in mine. Mm -hmm. Have in mine. I go back to the years that I was on finance committee. There were a couple of years where the, in, from previous administrations, um, where teachers were not cut. It was all administrators that were cut. Um, for the same reason, we wanted to uh, protect the number of teachers in the classrooms, but also we were getting close to getting to the point where we were going to be violating the contracts with the teachers back then. Uh, but, um, you know, we went for a number of years um, understaffed in administration uh, where, uh, you know, I would regularly go by and I would see principals and, um, and assistant super or superintendents in the building still at 8, 9 o'clock at night still doing their jobs just to try to keep up with it. Um, so I... I, I guess... I, 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 just, I just don't like... That's okay, don't worry about it. I, I just don't want you to, to um, make the statement that it's never administrators. Um, okay, that's fair. This, this, the administrations and administrators that I have worked for in the past and with in the past, um, they're very conscious of that, uh, and, and they take that into consideration. And I've heard some of these conversations in the past, and I've had administrators talk to me about it in the past. And uh, it, it's, 
it is always an extremely difficult conversation. You know, you don't want to put it on the teachers. You don't, because they have a hard enough job as it is. But as you know, Dr. Flanagan said, it does get to the point where you still have to run a school. Uh, and uh, it, it's a difficult decision, but it has to get made sometimes. I guess my, as a citizen, I haven't noticed as many administrators. So maybe it's the administrators that I, I'm not aware of that have been cut. Sure. Which could be the case. But in my experience of the ones I visualize and I see, I've, it, it's always seemed that Tingsboro has been very administrative heavy. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's just the perception as a citizen as opposed to not part of the committee. I, that's th right. I think that's probably fair. That's fair. I, yeah. And I didn't mean to say that it was easy. That was not my intention. It just, in my educational experience, it always feels like it's that. Okay. Thank you for running. Any other? Just one comment, if I may. Um, since Dr. Flanagan has taken over as superintendent, with these eight and a half cuts, I believe we're at 28 or 29 full-time equivalents cut from Tingsboro Public Schools since you've taken over. I can get that number for you. It was in the teens. It was 20 point, point 20.5, I believe. It's been, it's been a lot. Um, so when he says we don't just take the budget and go from one year to the next, 28 full-time equivalents cut from our budget in the last six years is a huge number. And it's from every group, um, from our maintenance personnel, mm -hmm. our janitors, staffs, our teachers, our administrators, our um, administrative assistants. There's a lot of superintendents out there that and assistant superintendents and principals that all have their own administrative assistants. We don't yeah, our central office went from 15 people down to eight in the past five, six years, five, in six five years. Five or six years. Yeah. So that's uh, seven cuts right there in, in, in the administrative area. So um, 28 full-time equivalents. Compare that to any of the other departments in the town of Thingsboro. Um, and I think, and, I and think we employ the majority if I, could, of, if I could piggyback off of that, I yeah. think that's the Dustine's point. Well, we used to have a curriculum coordinator. We used to have a grant writer. We used to have a professional development coordinator. We used to have all these other positions that existed uh, that you wouldn't see. You wouldn't see. Uh, they're gone. And now he does it. I do it. Joe does it. Sarah does it. Sharon Fairbanks does it. Um, we just we pick it up to protect as many teachers in the class as we possibly can. So... Um, but that, it's a fair point. Now I got a quick question. What's, what's the average um, student enrollment between like um, the elementary, the middle, and the high school? Like how many, you know, not, not an exact number, how many kids between first, second, third grade? You know what I mean? I'm just looking at the... Uh, Eight, so. so we try to be 18 to 20 in the lower elementary, low 20s in the upper elementaries, in the 20s, low 20s at the middle school, and the high school depends on the, the, what classes the kids are taking. Um, but it's usually high teens to mid twenties. Maybe like an AP class has ten or eleven kids in it, but it's still that's a program that we're going to run and not cut because of ten kids in the class. You know, so right. we got to protect that. But and that's off the top of my head. I mean, I can certainly run the numbers if we had to. But no, I'm just curious. That's about where it is. Yeah. Did you have something? I got something. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I have a I have a comment as a parent and a citizen, and then just kind of a cautiously optimistic question. Um, the comment I want to make as a parent and a citizen is just to reinforce my vote in October or whenever it was to hire Kristen Russo as that additional admin. Just anecdotally talking to other parents, Dr. Riley was swamped this year. Um, and I am sure that having her on board will be a huge help. And I would not doubt as a parent and citizen that we see in the future as this as these classes start to move their way up through the middle school and the high school, that we're having this same conversation in four or five years as to whether or not Mr. Adams is going to have an assistant or another coordinator at his side as well. So just something to keep in the back of our head, that these needs do have administrative needs in the back. And while it absolutely is hard to make the decisions to cut teachers and I volunteer at the elementary school and I see what those teachers are going through and I know that these are hard decisions and that it will affect everybody 
sometimes those are the decisions we have to make, and sometimes they're just hard. So that's just my comment as a parent and a citizen. Um, and then, so my cautiously optimistic question. Mm -hmm. If Governor Healy does come out and OSD slacks off a little bit, mm -hmm. Is this staffing cut the first place that we'll look to start to kind of? 100%. Okay. Teachers first. 100%. Okay. And, and just so you know, the recommendation was to hold districts harmless for anything over their 2.5% increase. So essentially, look at what the increase had been, the 2.7%. Anything above that would be hopefully potentially backfilled to the communities to support that. So right. ours was 138,000 or 138, I think. So if another 85,000 came in, you know, potentially we could look at a, t a teacher or two to, to, to plug back in. Okay. You know, and again, you know, it's March 21st. You know, the census also said that we had 75 kids going to register in kindergarten. We've had 106 so far. So if we find that we need another teacher at some point, we're going to have a different conversation. And this is going to continue to evolve. We don't know where we are, but as, as of today, this is the recommendation to get to a number. Are there any other budget-related comments or questions? Mr. Messina, thank you for all this work. Um, and I know that it doesn't stop tonight. It continues every day. So um, thank you for, for all of this. You're welcome. Mr. Messina, do we need formal action on this tonight to have it a public hearing next week, or do you need so, formal? So my next comment was going to be, we don't necessarily need a formal action tonight. It's if the school committee wants to, to make a vote, I think it's actually written that way to, to vote in the initial budget. What will happen next Tuesday night, we'll start the meeting, uh, your regular meeting, by opening up a public budget hearing. Once that hearing is done and we close that hearing later on in, in your agenda, you'll, you'll vote in the, 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 budget, the budget with the school committee budget portion. Um, as a final number to present to the town. But you do that after the public hearing. Okay, so. So no action tonight. No action tonight. No vote tonight. Not necessary, no. Okay, very good. And again, we're happy, you know, we gave you a ton of information. Please dive into it. Shoot Joe an email, myself an email. We're happy to get back to you and, and, and answer any questions you may have. Absolutely. Thank you both for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You're welcome to stay. I am. I am staying. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I, this is my first time. I, I like like to see how it goes. <laughs> All right. So we will um, go back to item number four, which is correspondence. Dr. Flanagan. Yes. So thank you, Madam Chair. We have two uh, items of correspondence uh, in your drive tonight. One is we are partnering with the town uh, as part of a state cybersecurity grant. Um, appreciate. I think I believe this came from. ARPA funding on the town side, but they extended the invitation to us to piggyback onto that. So it's an assessment of the, our security systems in the school. Uh, Mr. Piper uh, took the lead on that and has put the information out to teachers. And I know that I, I think uh, we've had several teachers already participate in the training right now, uh, the module. So that gives us a sense of where we are and maybe identify some of the gaps that we have and we can correct those. Mr. Flanagan, Dr. Flanagan, yeah. um, I actually participated in this in my former district, and it was actually just personally really helpful. Great. Uh, I changed a lot of things in my the way that I did things. So, um, it's just not only is it good for the school and the right. district, but it's it's good personally as well. So, win win. Yeah, the ABC one two three password doesn't cut it. Oh, so, <laughs> um, the other piece of information that's in your folder uh, has been a, a request to bargain from Council ninety three, our maintenance and custodians group. They would like to um, begin that process as their contract is up uh, June thirtieth this year, and I believe that's. Tony, Ryan, and Jeff on that committee. Um, so we'll get back to you on that. And that's it for correspondence. Great. Uh, for personnel, we have notifications of resignation from Samantha Rosa, THS math teacher of over six years of service, and Rachel Leo, TS, TMS administrative assistant um, with over 10 years of service. I'm wishing both of you well. Uh, notification for request for paternity leave for Michael, is it Layden? Layden. Layden. Yep. THS uh, foreign language teacher, and uh, congratulations to Mr. Lydon. And a notification for maternity leave for Colleen Hood, a TES teacher um, expected to go on leave around May 11th, and uh, wishing you good luck. Uh, share the success, Nate. 
Yeah, so it's been a couple of weeks, but I tried to condense it. Um, <laughs> so over the last few weeks, TES has welcomed um, Keys to Literacy coaches into their classrooms to see the strategies that have been shared through the ongoing professional development that they've been working on. Um, the Keys to beginning reading cohort, which was from grades K through three, has completed training modules around phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, phonics, and fluency. Um, and then the key comprehension strategy cohort, grades four, five, and six, um, has completed training modules uh, that enhance comprehension and understanding. Uh, kindergarten through grade five, teachers opened their classroom doors to consultants and their grade level colleagues, and teachers and service providers were able to observe the science um, of reading strategies in action. Um, and then Mrs. Cavanaugh I would just like to give a special thank you to TES teachers for all their hard work with ELA this year. Um, they've been working pretty hard on that. Um, TMS had a great spirit week. Um, they had a successful winter fest as well, um, with many students and staff participating. And then their March Madness, which was um, last week, took place um, with around 200 middle school students participating in the dodgeball tournament on Thursday after school. And then they had their finals on Friday. My brother and sister both did that. They had a really great time. So that was fun to see them enjoying. Um, then they also had basketball 3v3, which took place on Friday after school as well. Um, and then TMS would like to thank the high school for allowing them to use the gym um, to do that. The celebration of learning at the middle school was well attended and the students did a great job as tour guides for their families. Um, they showed everyone around to everything that they were doing in their classes, so that was uh, cool for them to do. And then the building project obviously is well underway as you can see. Students, staff, and parents all adapted their routines to use the back door as the main entrance at the middle school. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, they would like to extend their thanks to the high school for um, you know, allowing them to use the gym and for the teachers and everything who are understanding, obviously, with a bunch of middle schoolers coming in every day. So, um, And then at the high school, um, congratulations to the THS Theater Program. Uh, they recently qualified for the semifinal round of the METG um, Festival for their performance of Little Women. Sabrina Osborne received the Stage Manager's Award. Natalie Landsteiner earned an Excellence Award for Assistant Directing, and Olivia Balkan took home an award for Excellence in Costume Design. Olivia Lambert, Caitlin Rao, and Izzy Schaefer earned Acting Awards, so great job to them. Winter sports season is wrapped up. Congratulations to all the teams and winter athletes. THS um, looks forward to recognizing them all uh, at the Winter Sports Awards night, which is this Thursday, March 23rd. And then um, spring sp sports started up yesterday, um, so that's exciting to see. And then congratulations to February Students of the Month, Emily Figazato, Olivia Lambert, Lindsay Methot, and Sean Sucasium, and as well as March Students of the Month, Caitlin DiPercio, Trevor Drew, Paige Matthews, and Colin Riley. And that's it. Thanks, Nate. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, two success. weeks. Yes, that was great. <laughs> Very fluent. <laughs> uh, this is our favorite part of the meeting, is to hearing what they're doing at the schools. So, um, thank you. Dr. Flanagan, uh, the superintendent report. Sure, so we'll go right down to the MSBA update. Um, Mr. Woodlock, if you keep going. Oh, sorry, right there, school committee meetings first coming up. Um, what's not listed on here, um, so you can see uh, with school committee meetings, we have a budget presentation to the select board on April 10th. I received that communication from uh, Tom and Andrew Hansen, so we presented to the select board on April 10th. Uh, pretty similar presentation we just did tonight. What's not on here is either the March 29th or April 4th school building committee meeting. There will be another school building committee meeting um, at some point in the next two weeks. We're just trying to nail down basically what the design, the 60% design, what does 60% design development when that will be completed. But that's the rest of your upcoming meeting schedule. So, Mr. Woodlock, if we can go right down, keep going to uh, MSB update. Keep going, oh, perfect right there. So, the MSB update, um, as of now, we had a school building committee meeting on March 15th. Uh, it was actually, it was, it was great because they brought in all the materials and finishes and laid them out on the table. So we were able to touch the, the products and the, and the finishes. And it was, it was a great opportunity to see the colors come together. And uh, it's exciting. They, they, they presented some pretty finished renderings to see the potential of where the, the new middle school is going to be. So that was really exciting to see all that information. Um, as of completed work at this point, they have almost... Finally, decouple the gym systems. There's one last fire pull station that they're going to decouple on Friday. Uh, the abatement of the gym is done. DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, came on today, um, and they are actually requesting that we expand the poly covering that currently exists over the main entrance and five windows on each side at the middle school to expand it, 
expanded to the entire width of that uh, facade that faces the gym. This Saturday, they're going to begin taking down the sky bridge. So they're going to take down the first section of the sky bridge from the school itself to the columns that are in the walkway, and then they're going to leave it there. They're going to leave the skim coating up on that facade that faces the middle school, and they will take all the skim coating off the other three sides. We went through a meeting yesterday, and they talked about where the uh, demolition pile will be, where the truck wash station, wash station will be. They explained when a <coughs> truck comes to take the material away, um, it will have two layers of 10-gauge vinyl. It will be sealed, it will be glued, it will be taped, and then there'll be a cover that goes over the truck to get the container out of here. Um, we're going to run, they're going to run five to eight trucks today. They will truck all the demolition to New York. So it's not like it's gonna be trucks coming around all day long. Once the truck's gone, we won't see it till the next day. So five to eight trucks, it'll be a three week process. So the plan is to get the first section down of the sky bridge, skim the rest of the building, then come back, take the rest of the sky bridge and the facade, skim that fa last facade, and then it'll be the super steel uh, construction uh, demo. So, um, <coughs> so effective Saturday morning, we'll start to see things happen. DEP did say today that they want the poly that's covering the main entrance of the middle school to stay intact throughout demolition. So that'll be up through probably April 7th. So it's about a three-week process. The other thing that they told us, um, just so I can get this on camera now, is oftentimes during demolition, people think that there's dust in the air. They are going to soak everything down, and what they often see is mist. It's not dust. We will have air quality control monitors that have done a baseline that'll be on site. And if at any point there's a, uh, a blip in the, in the monitor, they're going to shut the thing down. And that person's in charge of when demo can begin again. So uh, talking about the, the processes and the experience of this group, um, it, was, it was amazing to hear. They have a, this down in the science. So, um, so that begins Saturday, so that's exciting. So that's the... Uh, that's pretty much the upcoming work. Dr. Flanagan, I remember them saying, too, just to a concern that you had mentioned about spring sports have begun and we have yes. dump trucks going around. They will have personnel flaggers yep. out there making sure that it's safe for a truck to proceed before, you know, there will be no accidents with any students, you know, crossing a road with a, with a vehicle coming down. So it um, seems to me that they've thought of pretty much everything. This is what they do, and they're very... Very good at what they do. I, I think the last thing we identified in our meeting today with uh, Mr. Paul and Mr. Ogden was we need um, to incorporate signage uh, for teams that are coming from other schools and kids that are here on the weekend. You know, the, the school generally isn't open at 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, so they're going to need to know park in the third parking lot and walk around the back of the school because if you try to walk around the middle school, that's the fence line all the way to the woods. You're not going to get there. So we need to work on signage before recreational sports start in town. And we have Ms. Palumbo reaching out to all athletic directors in the district to let them know their kids are cut through the school. Dr. Flanagan, does, will the front doors of the middle school remain closed for the next three weeks? Yes, okay. but they are open for emergency egress. It's just, it's just a zipper. So we have to inform the kids that if in the event of a fire drill or anything, you can go out there. Um, but for the next three weeks, we need to keep that closed. What about the windows? Um, are the windows on the building to remain closed? I'm not just talking on that um, side. Are you talking the whole building? No, just no. that side. Okay. Just that side. They're going to poly those. The other ones can be open. Okay. And my understanding is this is excessive poly, but it's what was recommended. So we that's do what we do what we're told. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the MSBA update um, as of today. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, um, we've already done 8, B, and C, so moving on to new business. Oh, teaching and learning, sorry. Mr. Woodlock. Oh. I mean, you teaching can skip learning. me if you no, want. No, we don't want to <laughs> skip you. This is the other exciting part of our Oh, uh, yeah, this is a good part. And so one of, one of the things I did over the last couple of weeks was ask our administrators, you know, come up with something that you we're proud of that, that's in line with our, you know, second big um, district initiative. So um, what we focused on was, you know, where are we providing comprehensive and inclusive learning environments? And so this obviously is not a comprehensive list, but just some highlights so you guys can know what some of the things that are going on. Uh, slight update, you know, you've had multiple presentations about the wind block that's going to be going into a pilot here at the high school. Um, Mrs. Trainer met with 
all of the students, explain to them exactly what was going to be happening as part of their scheduling um, presentation that they do each spring. And they also got feedback from the outgoing seniors who won't really be able to enjoy this process a whole lot, but just to get some ideas about, you know, what are your thoughts on this? What would you like to see? Um, and so uh, getting some student feedback there is definitely part of uh, inclusive environments. And also wanted to highlight the, um, the instructional practices of Mrs. Makovich, Ms. Taylor Makovich, former student. Um, not surprised she's doing amazing, but she has been really working to incorporate SEL practices into her classroom every day and making sure that the, stu the students that come into that classroom have ample opportunities to kind of think about and self-reflect on where they are, how they're feeling, and giving them uh, strategies to, you know, when you're feeling really down, these are some things you can do, or when you're feeling really up and we have work to do, you know, these are break, you know, building in breaks and things like that. So she's, she's going above and beyond what we've asked her to do for this first year as we roll out some new uh, expectations for teachers. Oh boy. Here we go. Um, secondly, at the middle school, um, I think Nate mentioned something about um, the keys to literacy that's been going on for professional <coughs> development. We have outside um, vendors coming in that have been really well received. So some of the things they've been looking to do is get some real calibration amongst the teachers in like teams. And so they've been focusing on you know, something that was identified as, you know, our kids have some gaps here and we need to work on it, which is summarizing skills and giving them different tools to utilize uh, across all teams that kids will know these particular skills. What typically happens is there are some things that some teams do and some things that other teams don't do, and that's okay. We don't want to take autonomy away from teachers, but we do want to say, like, these are things that happen all the time so that when you get a student from you know, fifth grade, even to sixth grade or sixth grade into seventh grade, you can expect that they're going to know what this is when you do it. So um, Mr. Pollitt really wanted to highlight the sixth grade and they're really, you know, digging in. And it's hard to take on new expectations and new things in the middle of a school year. Teaching is a difficult job, uh, but they've really uh, gone, gone at it and done a great job of using uh, specifically top-down webs, two-column notes, and these different summarizing strategies. So trying to make sure that kids have um, a baseline of those typical things. And oh, I did it again. <laughs> Mrs. Cavanaugh really wanted to highlight the, uh, the efforts of the kindergarten team. Um, you can't click this link here, but if you go to the website, uh, the school website, uh, and you just type in kindergarten in the search, it'll pop up there and you can look at it. Um, Jackie Richardson worked with them to create a great video, and there's nothing cuter than looking at kindergarten kids in action, you know, so uh, it's really a great little video, but I just wanted to highlight the efforts of the kindergarten team and the students. Um, it, it's probably been a long time for many of you since you've been in a kindergarten classroom, and I've had the great opportunity to see what that looks like in the first week of school and now see what it looks like in March and wow what a great job they do. I mean these kids they come in with limited experience with routines and rituals and that type of thing and the the work that they do with these youngsters is is pretty amazing. So uh, congrats to our kindergarten team and when you get a chance to take a look at that video it's really really pretty special. I'll just add on that congrats to the kindergarten team. Kindergartners are tough. <laughs> All right, so now we can move on to 9A, the 23-24 school committee calendar. Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair. In your drive, you will see uh, the draft school committee calendar for 23-24. Uh, very similar to uh, this year's calendar, we open uh, with teachers or the proposals that we open with teachers on uh, August 28th before Labor Day. Uh, this is all contractual. This is what we've done in the past. Um, really, no curveballs here. It's it's kind of the same calendar we've we've used in the past. Is there any discussion? Any questions on that calendar? Give you just a moment if you're looking at it. Um, I'll seek a motion to approve the 23-24 school calendar. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? That carries. For the record, we did work with uh, the union leadership on this as well. So we're all in agreement on this. All right, great. Um, I don't think we have a 9B. We do not. And moving on to finance with Mr. Messina. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you may notice there are no signing of bills tonight. We're actually sort of off a little different cycle right at the moment. Um, 
there were bills signed in lieu of your school committee meetings, both on the March 14th meeting. Uh, Mr. Mullen, as your single signer, did come in the next day and signed 13 bill warrants that are listed in your drive. Um, also, in lieu of the February 28th meeting, uh, Mr. Mullen came in and signed 14 bill warrants on behalf of the committee. Again, in the drive is the list of warrant numbers, accounts, and amounts. For signing of payroll, this is actually the signing of payroll we would have done on February 28th. Uh, the payroll dated February 13th and February 27th. Uh, we'll do the next two uh, payrolls at your next meeting uh, on the 28th. Also, the February financial package is in your drive, and those are your three reports, the school committee budget as of the end of February, the revolving account balances at the end of February, as well as the student accounts. And for enrollment, I will leave that to the chair. Sure. At TES, we have 766 students. At TMS, we have 404 students. At THS, we have 416. We have 24 out-of-district students for a total of 1,610 students in Tingsboro Public Schools. Uh, school committee discussion, Nate. Nothing at this time. Thank you. Jeff? Uh, just uh, thank you to Mr. Messina for all the work that's been put into the budget. I'm sure, you know, even after tonight, there's probably something has moved on there that you haven't seen yet. But it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of work. So we do appreciate everything you put into it. Thank you. Joe, yes, thank you so much. This was an amazing presentation, and you've done so much work, and it's very appreciative how detailed it is. You, you do a great job. Um, also, I'd like to take note of Rachel Leo's resignation. She's always been a sunny disposition in the middle school office. Whenever I had to go down and chat, she was always there, and she was always very pleasant to chat with. Um, congratulations to the winter sports teams. They did a great job, um, and that's it. Mr. Woodlock? No, thank you. Joe? I'm good tonight. Thank you. Rob? Another great job to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, echo for um, Mrs. Leo uh, leaving. I was going to wait till the end of the year to uh, say something, but since you uh, brought it up, why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll go on my usual long diatribe. Uh, uh, Rachel uh, ha has been there for quite a while now. She's uh, always, uh, as you said, sunny disposition. She's uh, not, not only that, but she's been, you know, so well organized. She, you know, you have a question, uh, any question whatsoever, and she's going to answer that for you. Uh, I, I know the administration uh, there depends on her greatly. Uh, she is going to be uh, missed quite a bit uh, in that role. The fact that she is giving us plenty of notice to be able to uh, uh, help find somebody of quality to be able to move into that role uh, to replace her, which will be difficult anyways, but uh, uh, it was very nice of her. Um, congratulations to the winter teams. and it, They did do a wonderful job this year, particularly the uh, uh, boys and girls basketball teams. Uh, I know somebody who has a uh, member of that, uh, that girls basketball team here. Um, uh, but that's it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Messina, for all the work you've put into this budget. And on a personal note, thank you for educating me on all the finer points of the budget and the budget subcommittee <laughs> meetings. I know I had a lot of questions. So, um, Are you an expert now? No. No? That's still Mr. Okay. Messina. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Right. So I visited the schools with Dr. Flanagan a few weeks ago. Um, every year I take a trip through all three schools. Um, this has been a long meeting, so I'll save my report for next week. Um, instead, I'll thank Joe, like everybody else, thanks to the budget. Um, great job, as always. Thank you, Eddie, Ron, for coming out. Um, I think it's valuable having you guys come out every year. Uh, I think it's definitely a good partnership. And echo what uh, Dustine and Rob said about Rachel. Um, Great presence in middle school, she's going to be missed. And thank you to Mr. Messina. Um, and just as important to your entire staff, Dr. Flanagan, for um, working with Mr. Messina and, and getting all these sad cuts um, to where we need to be. Um, thank you to our friends in the Finance Committee for coming in this evening. Um, and I echo the rest of the comments. 
Dr. Levy. Thank you for the finance committee. Appreciate coming. Uh, I would just uh, like to say to our seniors, you are entering your last trimester here at the Tingsboro Public Schools. Enjoy it. Have fun. Take a deep breath. I know that the next month and a half is going to be very difficult for you as you start to think about that May 1st deadline and where you're going to go to college and make big life decisions. Take a deep breath. It's going to work out. Enjoy your time here in Tingsboro. All right? That's all I have. All right. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Woodlock for the deep dive on teaching and learning. Um, I, I caught you off guard there, didn't I? Um, <laughs> I usually just fly to the roof. I know. I mean, you, did, you nearly forgot about me earlier. I know, right? Um, I, like, I really appreciate the way that um, you've revamped the teaching and learning updates and um, the, the more detail that we're getting, this is really helpful to understand better about what's going on in the schools. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Flanagan, you know, we ran through the Valley Collaborative pretty quickly, but um, I, I want to revisit that and just say, you know, thanks to you and your office um, for negotiating that contract, Mr. Messina. Um, it's, it, it's a great asset to this community to have that building um, completely revitalized um, as if it, it was, as if it were new um, it wasn't new 30 years ago when I went there and now it is um, so thank you for that I appreciate it um, with that we do not have a need for executive session so I will seek a motion to adjourn so moved second any discussion all those in favor aye, aye. 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 opposed that carries we are adjourned thank you